And now it is my pleasure to again welcome Dr. Araz, uh, our special guest from the UK. Dr. Araz, um, uh, let me introduce you uh, again. Dr. Araz obtained his BSc in mathematics in Koei University in 2009. He's obtained his MSc and PhD both at the University of Buckingham in the UK in 2013 and 2020 respectively. He's working now as a mathematician and machine learning researcher at Oxford Drug Design. He's also uh, a junior researcher fellow in the, in the School of Computing at the University of Buckingham. And today he will be sharing with us his expert information and knowledge on machine learning system design. So Dr. Araz, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you very much for inviting me over to share uh, some of the knowledge that I have about uh, designing machine learning systems. Um, okay, let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you can start. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to briefly talk about um, uh, some of the um, uh, things to bear in mind when you design a, a successful machine learning uh, um, system. Uh, and then uh, at the end, I will focus more or less about uh, modeling part, which, uh, uh, and in the modeling part, I will focus on, on deep learning, different deep learning architectures uh, that are specifically designed for computer vision and what is uh, um, the hot topic in this field now? And um, um, is there any research gap that we can contribute uh, or not? Um, so I start by uh, uh, just sharing this uh, um, definition of a machine learning, which is slightly different from the definition that uh, Mamas Nigar gave uh, in, in, in her introduction. So, uh, and uh, I know that because this uh, presentation is, is now um, shared live, live on Facebook. So just for the people who does not understand or doesn't know anything about machine learning, in, in a very simple word, uh, machine learning uh, can be regarded as a branch of artificial intelligence, intelligence in general uh, and computer science uh, and uh, focuses on the use of data and algorithms um, combined to imitate the way that humans learn and gradually improve uh, its accuracy. So what you have here, uh, the aim of designing a machine learning uh, is that you want to be able to perform um, some sort of a task, um, uh, the way that humans doing it, not just automation, but injecting some sort of uh, intelligence um, into it. Uh, and this definition is by the IBM, by the way, it's not mine. So. Um, although uh, there are other ways of defi defining a machine learning. So um, machine learning, as, as I said, so you can think of, of it um, uh, this way. When you have a child, um, the child needs many years to understand how to crawl, how to walk, how to speak, right? And of course, the child every single day scans the environment around herself or himself. Right? So it's a long process, but at the end of the day, it's a process of learning, right? Uh, and here we try to do the same thing. The data is something that we gather and the algorithm is something that we design for this data. Uh, and we, we, we try to make our algorithms to be uh, um, a bit clever. And then this is how the machine learning world uh, works in a, in a very abstract way. Um, now, the, the, the question that we need to ask ourselves when designing uh, a machine learning model, uh, how can I measure or how can I start if I want to design a good machine learning model? So there are some, some, some things you need to think about when you design a model, a machine learning model. First of all, the problem definition. What is the problem that you have? Okay, what is the problem in, in, in hand? So you need to have a clear definition of the problem. And the reason um, um, I added this, uh, I will explain it later on. Then the data, what does the data look like? Then the evaluation, then the features, then, uh, then and only then, 
you have the model design, and specifically, I will be focusing on deep learning architectures. Then, of course, experimentation. How do you how do you go and and do your experimentations? And at the end, is it important your model to be explainable, transparent? What about the ethics? Um, are you using uh, data, or are you are you designing something which are legal, which are trustworthy? Uh, are you not violating any privacy sort of uh, um, regulations. So um, let's focus on the first part, the problem definition. So how do you define a problem for machine learning, right? So first of all, you need to know that, okay, machines are uh, not like humans to start with, okay? H how can you insert the data that you have, the information that you have to the machines? Okay, everything needs to be in a very, again, very uh, advanced way, uh, mach machines only understand um, um, vectors or matrices or um, uh, let's say zeros and one uh, lists of um, uh, vectors, right? Sorry, I'm, I'm hearing my voice. Maybe someone needs to... Vectors or um, uh, let's say zeros and one uh, lists of... Um, Okay, thank you. So once you have a clear definition of the problem, uh, then you need to think how is this uh, uh, problem or how is the solution for this problem will benefit my business if you have a company for the society or for the humanity. Otherwise, if you want just to design something for fun, then it is fine, you can still do it, but it will not be sort of uh, usable by, uh, by the machine learning community or by the society in, in general. So it, it is mostly good that you try to solve a problem uh, that has some sort of a benefit for a society, humanity, company, your business or whatever. Uh, then the other thing you need to think about while you're designing your uh, um, uh, machine learning model and while you want to uh, define your problem is that what is the success look like and what do I mean by this so the success means that if you if you design a machine learning model and at the end uh, the model will give you let's say 90 percent um, accuracy or 95 percent accuracy is it good enough maybe 70 percent is uh, accuracy is, is is good enough and the reason is that it is not always bad that you have 60% or 70% accuracy, because the problem is, is not an easy problem. You may not have enough data, or even maybe humans uh, cannot uh, surpass, let's say 70 or 80% accuracy. It's not always true that um, you need to have 99% accuracy. And let me guarantee that if you have a 99% accuracy or 100% accuracy uh, about your model, then it's highly likely that uh, it's highly likely, likely that there is a problem with your system or either your data or your evaluation or something, right? Um, and sometimes when you design your machine learning algorithm, 1% increase in accuracy matters. Sometimes it doesn't matter. For example, um, we have a well-known um, database called ImageNet where you have over a million images and these images are uh, classified into a thousand classes. Uh, is it okay if you increment 1% of that because this is not an easy task? Maybe yes. Sometimes you're working in a bank and you want to prevent fraud and um, uh, losing money and 1% increase means that you're saving millions of dollars or pounds. Maybe it's good. In other cases, maybe 1% is not good. So you need to have a clear view before you go away and design your system. What is the problem looks like? Does it going to benefit anyone? And what does the success look like? Then the next thing you need to think about is the data. Um, what does the data look like? I mean, you may, you, you may be surprised if I tell you that data has a shape, okay? And you need to have a clear vision that, okay, even if you don't know what the shape of the data means here, but you need to, th you need to know that uh, uh, is the data coming from different sources? Do you need to work in real time or you can train your system offline and then you can come back and do your things um, real time? 
the SEO system, again, needs to be, uh, as I said, trained in real time, work in real time, or work in offline, for example. And the reason I'm focusing on this is maybe you are allowed to train your system offline. And what do I mean on offline? For example, you have, let's say, millions of images if you want to detect fake faces, for example. And or you, um, so you train your model offline, you go away and you go to your lab and you, dis you train your system. And then when you come, then the testing maybe needs to be in real time or actual work needs to be uh, in real time. Is there an inconsistency between your test and training uh, data? So most of the machine learning models uh, needs uh, splitting your data, i.e. training and testing. Is there any inconsistency? For example, you're going to uh, put all the easy um, um, cases to be in testing and all the hard cases or uh, in, in, your, in your training or vice versa. Uh, do you suspect that while you're training your, uh, your machine learning model on the data, uh, maybe the distribution of your data is, is, is different between the training and the testing? And the reason is that, okay, let me give you this, this scenario. Let's say that uh, you you have data, uh, you have medical data all coming from one hospital and this hospital, uh, they have a Simon's, um, let's say machine, a specific type of a machine that you have collected all your data and you train no. your, and you train your machine learning model on this data. On the testing, maybe you will get data from a different hospital, different device, or maybe even from a different country. Does that going to, um, affect your overall system design, your accuracy. So you need to be careful about your, um, your actual underlying data. So understand your data before you proceed and design your model. Then comes the evaluation. So, and specifically, how do you split the training and testing uh, validation? So, this training and testing validation um, is regarded as one of the gold standard in machine learning. And the reason is that um, imagine you have uh, a data set of cats, for example, and you want to design a machine learning system that can identify and detect a cat uh, picture, right? If your machine learning model only trained on cats or on colored images or on cats that you see the faces of the cats are like this. And in your testing, you have uh, the second uh, picture. Is that going to work? Is that going to affect my system? Of course it does, okay? So you need to have a clear sort of understanding about your data and how you train and test your uh, system, I, how do you split it, right? Um, then is it okay to perform a random split? Say that you have a data set of uh, 1000 images, um, 500 is from one class, 500 from the, another, from the second class. Is it okay that all the time you uh, do a random split? Maybe it is, maybe it is not. Let me give you an example. So uh, imagine that you have um, human faces. You, a very small portion of the faces are coming from Africa. And you know that the structure and the texture of faces of humans coming from Africa are different. The color, the structure, uh, and, um, so, and so many things. What do they have in common? Of course, humans, they have two eyes, one nose and one mouth. But look at the structure. First of all, the texture. Uh, and everything. Uh, and you have a small portion of, of faces that are coming from Africa. When you do a random split, maybe none of the images will go to, um, to testing. Maybe none of them will go to training. So you just need to be careful about how you do your splitting. Okay. And all I'm saying is that sometimes random split is fine, but in, in many other cases, it is not fine. So just be aware of that. Then how do you prevent your model from um, inducing unnecessary bias? Um, so bias means uh, that you, uh, 
there are some sort of hidden bias in your data or maybe even in your, in your design model. Um, so you need to prevent it. Again, let, let's take an example. You train your system. Uh, you train your system based on images that are coming, let's say, from Middle East, okay? And then you take your model and you want to test it uh, in China, okay? You, you need to be aware that your data is from a very specific geographical um, uh, region and you're going and taking this model into another uh, place. Is that okay? Or is that not okay? Uh, another example, um, I think in the last, uh, I think it was two years ago, maybe more or less, Amazon was in the news. And the reason was that, okay, they said you have a secret AI recruiting tool and um, the tool was showing some sort of a bias against women. You may thinking that, okay, how can AI models be biased or how can, AI models even be racist. Sometimes you see in the news and BBC or CNN or these channels, they call uh, the artificial intelligence models to be racist, to be biased. You need to ask yourself, what is this? And, and the underlying uh, issue is, again, goes back to the uh, data or maybe in your training and testing splitting, okay? Um, so if you have a model uh, trained on uh, men's only, of course, when you come and test it on women's, they may show some bias towards the men. They classify and they accept men's better than women's and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, uh, features for uh, the next fundamental or the next important uh, point, I think, uh, is features. If I give you a flower image uh, or picture like this, and I want you to extract some features, okay? And here by features, I mean some discriminating information from this flower, okay? Forget about machines, forget about artificial intelligence for a second. If you ask yourself um, that, uh, okay, how can I recognize a flower like this, okay? There are some factors you can straight away think about. Okay, maybe there's a color. There, there are two or three or four colors. Uh, how many leaves do you have? Okay, you can count the leaves and say, okay, whenever I see a flower like this, I count the leaves. If I have the same leaves and the same sort of structure, then this is, I will categorize flowers to be in the same uh, category, uh, right? Now, what does this mean? This tells you that good features, good discriminating features, uh, most of the time needs domain knowledge, creativity, and a lot of time, okay? The more you spend time on looking at your data, looking at samples of, of the data that you have, then you will have some idea of designing a model that can extract good features, okay? Of course, then you, you ask yourself, am I going to design a model that uses a handcrafted features or am I going to design a model like deep learning that automatically learns features? Even, even deep learning, even if it's automatic learnable, there are still some um, uh, factors you can control to extract the features that you want. You want local features, global features, and so on. Then you may think that, okay, sometimes you, you are um, extracting a lot of features and maybe some of them are not important. And this is what we call a redundant features. So you may think of reducing that. And this is known as a dimensionality reduction, which is uh, uh, a whole area of research that how, how to best reduce the dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Now, after having all of this in mind, then, uh, the step of designing uh, 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 the machine learning or a, a, an AI model comes uh, next, right? Uh, so here I'm going to very quickly uh, take you through some of the deep learning models. Um, I don't know how much time do I have uh, because if I don't have a lot of time, I can quickly uh, scan um, some of the methods. Am I good on time? You can take your hand, Doctor. We have a time. Great. 
Okay, so model design. Uh, so how can I design after I know about after um, after I have you have designed your uh, problem or you define the problem success right? You know uh, details about your data, uh, how you split your data about training and testing, um, and you have an idea of what sort of information you need to extract from your uh, data because you know that these are discriminating um, features from your data, then and only then comes the model design, okay? So let me take you through some of the deep learning uh, architecture and um, uh, see that uh, where, how the field of deep learning, which is one of the uh, um, hot topics these days, one of the, uh, one of the first uh, go and try sort of tool uh, in AI and machine learning, right? So how is it evolved and what is the current uh, state of the art uh, methodology in this area? Um, so in computer vision and especially for the classification, I'm going to list some of the very well-known um, uh, architectures. So. In 2012, uh, this um, AlexNet, it was one of the um, uh, very first uh, well-known deep learning architectures that had been proposed by researchers uh, in Canada that, uh, um, that was good at the time and outperformed most of the uh, other methods in the field. Um, and AlexNet, for the first time, he used more than one convolutional layer. Thank you, Mamsa uh, and Nigar, for explaining uh, how the convolution part is working. The convolution part that Mamsa uh, Nigar uh, explained, uh, instead of having one convolutional layer, AlexNet, they said, okay, you can have multiple convolution layers, i.e. multiple layers of aggregating and extracting the features, uh, and then do your classification. Then you have a VGG net family and VGG net family, they proposed uh, more than one architecture whereby they said that you can have 16 layers of feature extraction or uh, convolutional layers, or you can have 19 convolution uh, layers. And they showed that if you have this sort of deep architectures, it is helpful. And by the way, these architectures um, uh, uh, that I am presenting here, their success uh, uh, rate are measured on ImageNet, as I said. So ImageNet, I'm, I'm repeating it again, is a large um, data set of natural images where you want to classify images into having cats, uh, dogs, airplanes, cars, and so on. So you have a thousand class and more than a million image. Then you have a, a ResNet family of architectures uh, after that, uh, ResNet architecture has been proposed by um, Microsoft researchers. What they did, they say that um, you can have even deeper models and um, they added a residual connection, GoggleNet or what is known as an inception. Uh, you have variations of that being proposed by researchers at Google, you have DenseNet, a family of architectures being proposed by researchers at Facebook. You have SqueezeNet proposed by, um, um, I guess, Stanford and Berkeley. You have MobileNet, ShuffleNet, FishingNet, and NASNet. Uh, so, so you can see that uh, these architectures being proposed by researchers all over the world, and but especially by the giant uh, companies like Microsoft, Google, and Facebook that are dominating the field now. When it comes to natural language processing, traditionally we have had uh, RNNs, recurrent neural networks, which is originally, if I'm not wrong, was proposed by researchers at the University of California. And in the 1997 or 1990s, um, researchers at München and Lugano University from Germany and Switzerland, they improved RNN and invented what is known as LSTM, long short-term memory, and recently in 2017, um, researchers at Google Brain, they proposed what is known as an attention models. Uh, and the title of the paper is known as attention is all you need. 
Um, and the main difference between attention and LSTM and RNN was that in attention models, you can process um, more than one word at a time, while LSTM and RNN, they are taking one word and doing uh, oh, an analyze, and, and analyzing it, right? And then recently, uh, well, this attention led to the creation of transformers, uh, which is the fundamental work of transformers. But in October 2020, uh, we have seen uh, an interesting paper uh, known as a vision transformers, whereby they use the idea of a transformer and use uh, an idea of a transformer, as we know, was originally proposed to analyze text and language. We see that researchers propose this vision transformer to be used for um, computer vision. Uh, so this vision transformer was proposed in October 2020 by Google researchers. Then in March 2021, we have seen swing transformers being proposed by researchers at Microsoft. I'm, uh, so I'm going to uh, take you through uh, AlexNet to SqueezeNet uh, just to show you how these ideas been uh, developed and progressed. And there, straight away, uh, I will go to vision transformers and swing, swing transformers and what is the difference? Because these are the state of the art sort of ways of designing deep learning uh, models uh, for classification in general and um, segmentation. So AlexNet uh, proposed in 2012, this is the architecture. I'm not going to the, uh, to the details of that, uh, but the main idea was you have more than one convolutional layers, three, uh, three fully connected layers. And you see, it is not very complicated architecture, but at the time it was state of the art. Um, VGG architectures, instead of having five convolutional layers, you can have 16 or 13 convolutional layers, and you can have 19 convolutional layers, okay? So you stack more convolutional layers, right? And, uh, and it works. And when I say it works, it works better than AlexNet in that case. Then you can have ResNet. What is the main difference between the ResNet and the VGG group? Um, and by the way, VGG uh, group, um, proposed by researchers at the University of Oxford by the Visual Geometry Group. So the main idea was to have residual connections. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I don't think you can see my cursor. Let me see if I can add. Um, it's clear, Doctor. We can see it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this residual connections uh, means that you can. Uh, connect and you can add or you can concatenate the results of the previous layer with the next uh, layer. And mainly this is to address the issue of a weight vanishing. And the, the issue of the weight vanishing means that if you have a very deep um, uh, convolutional neural networks, sometimes while you're updating the weights in these convolutional layers, uh, the layers at the very beginning of your architecture may not be as uh, as good as the weights in the very um, uh, or at the at the last of your at the end of your architecture because while you're updating the weights, the weights at the very beginning will be um, um, will right. be will be modified the very sort of. Um, how do I put that? Uh, will not be modified in a good way. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Um, GoggleNet, uh, or uh, as it is known uh, in the literature as Inception, what Google does that, uh, beside the idea of having more convolutional layers and residual connections, uh, you can have uh, an Inception model. Uh, so what is an Inception model? So you can have an inception model or an inception cell that you can have a one by one convolution and three by three and five by five and max pooling all in one uh, model. And then you concatenate all of uh, the results and then you go to the previous layer. So this is a, very, uh, a naive inception model, but you can have uh, a model with the 
dimensionality reduction as well. So what do you mean by that? So you can, you can have different convolutional uh, filter sizes and reducing the dimensionality at the same time inside one block or one inception module, right? Uh, so what you do, you stack uh, a number of these convolutional cells one after the other. So you can see that in, uh, there's a number of these, convolu uh, um, these convolutional sort of cells. You put them next to each other uh, in a very deep way. And then this is the goggle net, right? So you have nine inception models, the first version. And then you have, again, to prevent the gradient vanishing, they have added two auxiliary classifiers. So you can see them in the, um, um, in the purple boxes. Um, and then you have, uh, the, uh, during the training, you add the loss functions together and in a way that you take the weighted sum of those, right? But then Google improved this architecture in the third version uh, known as Inception V3 that beside having um, uh, Inception modules, you can, you, they have added uh, residual connections. So it's a, um, so it's a combination of um, uh, stacking more convolutional layers first, inception modules second, residual connections from ResNet all uh, in one architecture, which is known as inception v3. Um, of course, some um, very de uh, technical uh, details there, but this is the main idea to have in mind. Then you have exception. Uh, again, proposed by Google, and you may think, okay, what has happened? So in the exception, they have introduced two new sort of ideas. One of them is known as separable convolutions. And what do you mean by separable convolutions? So the separable convolution, imagine that you have a colored image and colored image is constituted of three color channels, RGB, right? So um, traditionally what you do, you randomly generate a filter and this filter will be multiplied by the three channels. While in the separable convolutions, you split this three channels and you propose a different filter for each channel. You do your convolutions as Mamus got explained. And then at the end, you concatenate the convolved features, right? Um, the other idea in, in, uh, in the exception was, uh, was a depth-wise separable convolution. So what you do is, again, you have the separable convolution, but at the end, what you do, this is from one channel, uh, you stack and you concatenate uh, the separable convolutions of different channels together in one sort of tensor, as they call it. Now, from that, uh, we have a dense net. So what is the main difference between DenseNet with the, with the previous architectures that we have covered so far? So DenseNet, again, uh, it's, uh, it's the same idea as residual connections, being, which has been proposed by uh, a ResNet family of architectures. But here, instead of concatenating uh, the feature vectors from the previous layer to the next layer, at each layer mm -hmm. of the convolutions, you concatenate your uh, results with the rest of the um, convolutional layers that are coming afterwards, okay? And as you can see, the connections are a little bit messy, but this is the fundamental idea. And I demonstrated that this is good and, and it helps and it works in many classification tasks, right? Then beside this, uh, researchers at the University of Berkeley and Stanford, they said, okay, we have the idea of a squeeze net. And by the way, just so that I'm not forgetting, up until this moment, um, whether you have Google net um, uh, and uh, VGG net, I haven't uh, discussed any sort of uh, information regarding how many parameters you have, how many, a GPU hours you want to train these systems. But I'm just trying to explain the, um, how this will progress and how the ideas uh, being progressed. So the squeeze net. Squeeze net, uh, as you can see, the architecture here what, um, is, is not that difficult. What is uh, interesting is the idea of proposing uh, what is known as a fire module. And the fire module I have 
displayed on the left hand side, you can see that um, you have a one by one convolution. And once you have this one by one convolution uh, being uh, randomly generated, then again, this would be splitted into two uh, uh, sort of branches. You have another one by one convolution and a three by three convolution inside the same file module, and then you're concatenating it, and then it goes to the next level, right? And they claim that this is uh, good, it works, um, and you squeeze your sort of architecture and it is a somehow a lightweight sort of architecture in comparison with the rest of the architectures. Now, having all of this in mind, uh, okay, uh, you may ask yourself, okay, is there anything I can do? Or, or, or what are um, um, the things that I need to have in mind if I want to, um, design a good deep learning architecture. You want to design your CNN architecture? Then first of all, you need to decide uh, uh, your convolutional filters. One by one, three by three, five by five, seven by seven, nine by nine, or 11 by 11. And the question is that what to choose? Maybe you, you want to design uh, your architecture by three by three filters only, a combination of three by three and five by five. But the question is that, uh, is there any information about what sort of features these are uh, different size filters are extracting? Yes and no. Well, yes, in the sense that the small fil uh, filter sizes are focusing on more local texture, while the, uh, the bigger the size of the filter, um, more or less it detects the global sort of features or structure uh, in, your, uh, in your images or in your data. Uh, then you have to decide what type of a convolutional operation you're going to uh, apply. Normal convolutions or separable convolutions or depth wise uh, convolutions. Beside this, you have the idea of deciding bias, pooling, activations, batch normalizations, and learning, right? These are all seems to be small, but they all have different effects on your uh, architecture. Pooling here means the dimensionality reduction. I'm going to use three by three. Uh, uh, what, what sort of pooling, sort of, sorry, max pooling, average pooling, and so on. Activations, are you going to use um, uh, ReLU, um, batch normalization, and so on. Weight initializations. Uh, are you going to use the Gaussian to initialize the, the numbers you have inside the filters? Or are you going to uh, use um, ideas from others, uh, others known as he or Khafir? Back propagation optimization. Uh, again, are you using stochastic gradient descent uh, in, in your learning uh, process? Or are you going to use momentum or Adams uh, optimizer? Number of convolutional layers. How many convolution layers are you going to put or stack together? Three, one, two, 10, 100, 200. There's nothing to stop you to use any of those. Um, but again, um, how can I um, um, sort of uh, design this? If you don't have a lot of data, maybe a shallow, i.e. a couple of convolutional layers or three or four, uh, might be enough. If your data is complex, you have uh, more than two classes, maybe you need to think about a little bit deep. Um, this is again, some general advice here. Then the number of dense layers, i.e. fully connected layers. How many fully connected layers is good? Uh, are you going to accept that three is always good or maybe five or maybe four? I don't know. Uh, or is it really necessary to have a fully connected layer? You can use global average pooling or it's known as a gap. Which one is better? I don't know. You decide. Residual connections. Do you want residual connections or not? Maybe if, you're, uh, if you don't have a very deep connection, you may not need it. But if you needed it, where and when do you use it? Inception cells. Do you, do you think that maybe in your architecture, if you have inception cells, normal or a reduction cell is good? Maybe you think, okay, I don't need it. Uh, or maybe you think you do but you need to decide what sort of uh, inception model you're using. Now, all of this, are you going to fine tune uh, or, or search for the best parameters and hyperparameters 
manually, i.e. handcrafted one, you design this manually, you just try this, experiment it, it's not good, try this and try that. Are you going to use this handcrafted version, i.e. manually, or are you going to use an automatic CNN architecture design? And what do I mean by this? So you have um, methods whereby you can search for the best options among some of the things that I have listed so far. And uh, these systems will select the best combination based on your data. And we have NAS, Neural Architecture Search. Uh, search. We have ENAS, which stands for Efficient Neural Architecture Search. You have DOTS, AutoKeras, SNAS, and so forth. And remember that some of these methods are based on reinforcement learning methodology. Others are uh, using Bayesian optimization. Um, you have stochastic search, you have game theory base. So there's a very rich uh, um, mathematical theories behind any of these methodologies, but you just need to decide how do you going to approach the problem in hand. Then regularizers and loss functions. Are you going to do any data augmentation? Is it useful? How do you use it? Key processing, noise reduction. So these are all factors, and I'm sure maybe I have missed some of them, but you need to think about and you need to have uh, this in mind while designing a CNN architecture. Okay. And at the end, interpretability techniques. Is it okay to have um, an AI model or artificial intelligence model that works fine, but you have no idea how it works? For example, if you design something for doctors in the hospitals, is it acceptable or not? Um, if it is not acceptable, then we have interpretability techniques. We have techniques that can shed some light on uh, um, how these methods working or some regions that's been used in your data or in your image to come uh, to or to output uh, the prediction. Okay, things like TAM, class activation maps, or things like gradient class activation maps and others, right? Um, now, um, so this was about convolutional neural networks in general, uh, how the, some of the ideas being um, progressed and how to design these. But uh, if we want to use the idea of a transformer models in computer vision, can we do that? It turned out, yes. So. This was the title of a paper published in 2020. Excuse me. Um, and it says that an image is worth a 16 by 16 words. Uh, and in it, they propose the idea of a transformers for image recognition. As I said previously, it was by Google researchers. So what do they, what do, they do? They said that, okay, uh, we have transformers um, and the model of a transformer can be seen in the left-hand side of my screen. Uh, maybe I don't have time to go through this in detail, uh, but what, what do they do? The, the fundamental idea is as follows. Transformers are taking word representations, okay? So let's say you have a sentence of let's say 10 words or five words, right? So they take these words after you transform the word into a, a vector representation or a list of numbers, they take those and they process them, okay? So the, the idea here is that when you have your image, partition your image into blocks, say nine blocks, you bring each block and you flatten it. So what is a block of an image? A block is an image patch is a list of numbers, right? You flatten those and then you, this will go through a linear projection. Okay, you just transform this um, and then you give it to, the, to your transformer, right? That's the fundamental idea if you know what attention means. Um, and as it is as if you have a set of words, but here each word is not a word here. Each word will be uh, the existing work of, um, uh, a list of numbers that comes from a patch, right? And this is the results. And they say, okay, it outperforms convolutional neural networks. Um, and then there's a SWIN transformer uh, by um, Microsoft researchers. They say that, okay, if you want to partition your images into 16 by 16 blocks, 
maybe it is not so good for segmentation. So they propose different types of uh, blocking of your image and they say it is good for classification as well as um, segmentation. Now, finally, this is the last uh, slide. So is there any gap for research contribution? Of course, yes. So the first thing you need to think about uh, is uh, your computational resources. Do you have a good computational resource in your lab, in your university or at your home? If yes, then you can maybe try and contribute in, in a very sort of larger scale on, on, on trying to onto millions of images. If not, then how do you design something efficient and small sort of architecture that can perform as good as those? Uh, maybe you can use Hadamard matrices for these linear transformations uh, that are shown in the transformers. Vision transformers are data hungry. One sort of uh, one of uh, the points about vision transformers, they need a lot of data, but they are more efficient where, when it comes to processing than CNNs. Then the question is that how does the how does it perform on small data sets? Let's say you have a small number of images, is it better to use visual uh, vision transformers or CNNs? Explainability, there's already a couple of papers about the uh, explainability of vision transformers and I have put it here, then you can, uh, you can check it. With that, I'm going to stop and thank you for your attention and um, let me see if there's any questions. Um, I'm happy to answer questions um, and you can ask your questions in either Kurdish or uh, English, I'm happy to answer, but I'm not going to promise that I will have answers for all your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ras, for your nice presentation. Uh, so uh, for all of the participants, if you have any question, please raise your hand or ask. Um, I think I'll ask the first question. Sure. Um, uh, Dr. Arad, um, actually, uh, you've mentioned that uh, is it better to use um, uh, a, a large number of, of data uh, for training and testing or not? Actually, one of the problems that I faced uh, in one of my projects was that I used uh, a small number of data uh, for, uh, uh, for biometric identifications. So the problem that I faced was uh, uh, the overfitting problem. That means uh, I had uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the output the accuracy of the training data was uh, about 99, but the, the testing data accuracy was only uh, 70. And I know the, 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 the reason was because of using uh, a, a very small uh, size, a very small uh, amount of data for training and testing. Uh, actually, uh, the reason of using a very small uh, uh, amount of data was um, uh, to, uh, to be near to the reality, as you know, for biometric identification, you may you may don't have a lot of uh, images from the from the trainers. Uh, but uh, what to do to minimize this overfitting problem, in your opinion? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, I, I think yeah, overfitting is one of the uh, one of the issues, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to current AI uh, systems. Um, I think the e the easy thing to do is to include more data in your in your training. That's the one thing to do. But I understand that sometimes you don't have a good computer to train your system, or you don't have enough data to train your system. So I think in 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 this scenario, um, um, you need to be aware of your testing data, right? <laughs> So uh, you have a small number of images or you small, the, the data is very small. And uh, if you in advance know that the testing will be on uh, a larger scale of data, then you need to ask yourself, why is that? Why, why I don't have access to the larger sort of uh, data in comparison with the smaller one in my training? If um, for some sort of data privacy sort of limitations, you don't have that, then I guess um, it's not an easy task, but maybe during training, um, observe that the, the, the um, what is it called? The evaluation accuracy and the model accuracy. Sometimes when you're training your model, if they are very far from each other, then there's some sort of an overfitting. Or sometimes some people is using or measuring the overfitting by external data. 
So how do you know the model is overfitting? Okay, during the training, you cannot observe anything, but the actual testing or is a method of knowing that, okay, there's some sort of overfitting. Okay, so that the only, the only solution is in, in this scenario is that, okay, you don't say that my model is ready to be deployed in practice. You say, okay, I have this issue. And maybe uh, one approach is that uh, you need to think about a good regularization method, whether this is data augmentation, specific type of, um, I don't know, loss function at the end, um, maybe pre-processing. So these are all factors you can consider to reduce the overfitting, but there's no guarantee that it would be the end. Okay, thank you very much, <laughs> Is there any questions? So you can ask your questions in, in Kurdish, English, Arabic. At any percent, you can be a Kurdish can have a percent here, for example. You can be a Kurdish in the Arabic, if there is any question. Abdul Basit has a question. Oh, Victor Abdel Basad. Yes, Victor uh, Abdel Basad. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, Sitnagar. Uh, thank you very much. I'm so happy to uh, have you all here. Thank you. Uh, let me just talk about two different things regarding the presentation of uh, Dr. Aras. One of them, he just separated the um, deep learning approaches in terms of its applications. So he talked about uh, computer vision and natural language processing. Uh, we can, I, I just want to make this comment that uh, actually it's not just about the application, these sort of, of methods, it's just regarding whether the data is a sequence data or it is an unsequenced data. So the RNN, LSTM, and uh, even some other sort of uh, ESN uh, models so are, are, are some sort of application that tries to deal with the sequence data, time series data. And actually there is some sort of argument whether uh, we can deal with a sequence data as a non-sequence data or the vice versa. So I just wanted to make this comment about these uh, two things, two, two different approaches actually, Paul for deep learnings. And, uh, I, and also I want to ask, or perhaps ask a question about uh, the whole, all, all of these sort of methods and models uh, of convolutional neural networks, especially. I just want to ask Dr. Aras during the survey that anyone can make in this convolutional neural network, are these, different models adding more value to the area of the research or it is just some sort of trying something else and having some new result and that's it. I mean, what is the trade-off? We have here the complexity, which is uh, somehow it is not applicable for so many applications regarding the data that Nigar talked about, uh, the overfitting, will happen when you, you don't have enough data. What is the most, what is the progress in these models? What are they, how they serve the area in the learning? So this is a sort of question we, it might be an argumentative question, Dr. Aras. So I, I just come to my mind when you talked about all of these methods about that. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Basit, uh, uh, for the comments and for the question as well. Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree that uh, when I split the two things, it was more or less about uh, the nature of the data. Is it a time series data or um, is it like a, some sort of a tensor data that you have? Um, but of course, I didn't have time to go through uh, everything. But um, the idea of having a transformer uh, seems to be unifying uh, the two approaches, whether it doesn't matter whether your data is a 
as a time series uh, based or is it um, or is it um, a tensor or matrix like uh, data things like images and videos um, and as for this for the question what do these different models add um, as I said one of the benchmarks of evaluating the goodness of these architectures is ImageNet. And um, ImageNet, in, as, as you know, is a very big data set. Uh, and now they even extended it. Um, so th th there are two things, as I said. So the goodness of the model is, sorry, would you mind? Someone, someone excuse me, someone needs to mute, please. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so there are two things to consider here. Uh, the goodness of these models as a benchmark is based on ImageNet or CFAST and, and uh, some of these well-known data sets. But others, when, uh, other factors are, when they design these models, as I said, they try to address some of the issues that we have in the current um, AI uh, models. For example, the issue of, um, weight vanishing, for example, uh, the idea of having a residual connections in comparison with the idea of having uh, VGG uh, type architectures is, is I think is, is a good and promising sort of advancement in the field. The idea of having uh, inception modules in comparison with having just um, stacking um, convolutions uh, one after the other, I think was again uh, another so sort of, um, approach that helped, and um, these and these and these uh, uh, and this again added some sort of a benefit. Uh, but in general, as I said, uh, they all claim to have addressed and solved. Or, or just to minimize some of the issues that the current AI models have. But yeah, so, but I don't know, to be honest. Um, and um, is it like somehow randomly you try something and if this thing is giving you a fantastic result, then you just go away uh, and publish it. Uh, is it a good thing? Maybe it's good for publication. But is it good? Is it is it is it actually improving some of the knowledge that we have in the field? That I don't know, and um, I cannot comment on it to be honest. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much thank for you, your uh, And we have another question from Mansouria. Mansouria, please. Okay. Uh, thank you. Oh, the beginning. Thank you. Your Put your mic, please. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Dr. Ara, Ms. Dr. Ida, thank you all for your presentation. Uh, actually, I enjoyed your presentation, your knowledgeable uh, presentation about in covering the computer vision and machine. Thank you. Um, oh, is uh, have something to say at the end, but for my question, uh, we are the uh, uh, so uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, we can't hear your voice. Uh, if you like, you can uh, type your question in the chat, please. Just, just be aware, Mam Sanigad. Uh, you have disabled the chat. The chat is disabled. Maybe you can give the permission uh, to Mam Sanigad so that he he can chat. He can, okay. Like I guess. Oh, now the chat is uh, enabled. Yeah. Mam Sanigad, please write your question in the chat. Is there any questions? 
Maybe let, let's give a chance to Mom Slavia to type his question. Uh, I'm okay. sorry, maybe there, I got a problem with internet connection. How is it now? Yeah, now it's okay. Please ask her a question. Uh, okay, uh, just I, at the beginning, I wanted to I wanted to say thank you very much for your knowledgeable presentation, your workshop. Uh, it was amazing. I really enjoyed the whole entire information. Um, and my question is, was related just for, with the data quality. Since we are talking about the computer vision, uh, when you are talking about the special for Dr. Aras, when you talk about data collection, uh, what, how will we, we deal with the information if uh, it has been classified, classified information? Maybe we're talking about, have you faced some problem with data collections? Uh, for example, when you get data especially from maybe classified institutions or organizations, they have the uh, camera, image, videos, but maybe they want to provide you, it's not a public, they don't want to provide information for the research purpose. Uh, how the, uh, these things, issues maybe can be covered or what is the procedures then yeah, uh, thank, for thank. the research purpose? Yeah, th thank you for the question, uh, Mount Slavia. Uh, well, the, I, the, the problem of data collection is a problem that I think everyone has all over the world. Here in, okay, someone needs to again to meet herself or himself. Um, so even in the United Kingdom here, this is one of the major issues. Um, and in Europe in general, I think everywhere in the world, uh, data is not easy to, to collect, especially if it is a classified one. Well, I would be very surprised if they provide your classified data to train your system. Uh, because what does a classified data mean? A classified data means that these are sensitive data. These are data that you may not have access to freely. They may be containing information about the public, which should not be shared with you, for example. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, uh, even if you don't have sort of uh, data, classified data, as, as you put it, uh, you should try or find some public data. Uh, if, if getting public data is not easy, then in that scenario, maybe you should switch and not work on this project. Because uh, remember, uh, most of these AI models are data dependent, right? They, they heavily, or at least they are heavily depending on the data that you have. Let me give you one example. Uh, I'm now collaborating with a number of researchers and I can see some of them here uh, in Kurdistan region to uh, try and analyze uh, COVID patients, okay? Uh, and we go to hospitals, or at least they go to hospitals, they have official letters from the universities, even from their ministries, whatever. They go to hospitals um, and they still refuse to give them data. What do you do? I don't know, I don't have the answer for that. But I think it would be good that, uh, this, is, this is my message, hopefully if there is anyone um, who have the power, like in terms, um, uh, like in terms of the hierarchy in the higher education, for example, we have a lot of data in Kurdistan region and especially like um, medical data that is simply wasted. What do I mean by that? So all of this uh, X-ray data, for example, and CT scans from COVID patients, okay? Where do they go? Uh, I, I, I know that some of the hospitals, they don't even collect this data for future reference to train their doctors, let alone to design an AI system, okay? And this is an issue we have. This is an infrastructure issue that we have, right? Uh, so uh, it's not easy. It is, it is, a, it is, a, it is an issue that uh, all the researchers uh, working in the field of AI we have, but hopefully, uh, but hopefully in, in, in Kurdistan region, uh, the government, the ministry, different ministries somehow um, will cooperate in providing more data, especially the data 
that does not uh, involve privacy. Uh, because remember, even when you collect uh, data, medical data, you need to have a con like a agreement. You, the, the patients needs to consent. Okay, uh, things about facial recognition images, so many data. Uh, the public need to aware. They need to give you the con uh, consent. They need to give you an okay that it is okay for their data, personal data, to be used for research purposes. Otherwise, you will have issue. Uh, when it comes to the ethics, okay. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Araz. I think there is another question from Mr. Shalot. Mr. Shalot, please ask your question. Hello, or Jaka. Sorry. So, hello. Sorry for that. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay, Spas, uh, Dr. Aras. Spas. Munjaka uh, Homza. Tab Masterum, the Zamko Salahadin. Project Medical Image Segmentation. COVID knows the Oktaza Basker, the me. Oh, Baskam. نخوش خانه کن کشی کتیش هست دکتر کم دادم لبو داتا ورگرتن آو داتا که خزن کرای لعنت به تابتی نخوش خانه حکومی کن تقریری نیا که آی آو کوویدی آن کوید نیا و با خوشت لعنتی طبی دزانی ل لورات اما بون منا يعني أو كسي كلسر أشي عكيا بون منا فوتوغرافرة كتنها الرسم كي دقري أو ناس عن إبزام آية كوفيد يعني كوفيد نية يعني تندها نخوش خانة سوما حتى تنانات لزور بي خاصة خانة أهلية كانيش علين إما بس رسمة كدقرين دبيتو بتسي لاي دكتور ودكتور بيت بلي نخوش نخوش كبزام آية أو كوفيد يعني كوفيد نية أو يكك لكيشة كانم كزور زور پیو ماندی ما بود کوکرنوی داتا و پرسیاره که تریش ما بود دکتر آم مدلانی که باز کردن کامیان باشتری نه با سیگمنتیشن نتیجه آن باشتری لب سیگمنتیشن نه کلاسیفیکیشن آو بود پرسیاره کم زور سپاس سلام و نوسایج زور سپاس بود پرسیاره که ام گوین تو رеспوند تو دیس کوچین این کردیش از ایت از بین uh, asked by Kurdish language, uh, but I'm happy to translate if any if anyone from Malaysia all over the world is is, is interested to hear what I say in English at the end. Zor spas vamsa, but I see what you can learn. Shkila kanu kubasim kert. U batakit katega tu ekzreg yan city scan akteya kada tewe system achi zira chi piedruz bke batakit debi true label true label akat heavy. Wata bezani aya awa. کووید یا کووید نیه. بله برای تو ترینینگ جی پیدا کی وقتا سیستم کد راهنمایی پیدا کی راهنمایی پیدا کی لسرتا نشکری اتو وینه چی بوده سیستم کد کن نزنی او وینه اتیا باشه. اویک دوم آیا چی بکرد باشه برای من او پسیاره که او هیوادارم او یعنی او مسیج بگات با باعثی که کدتوانی نیارم تیب دنیا خود آوانی که اینترست یعنی هی دعایمید ایش بکن لبواری تکنولوژی زنیاری و یا خود آرتیفیشال اینتلیجنس برای استی دیتا لعنت توزع آسانتر بیکوب کرده ولکوردستان نتایج